Hi, I'd like to talk to you today about, about a pretty underrated system called the nimzovich larsen system or the nimzovich larsen attack. Um, this has been played by Bent Larsen or popularised by him, I suppose, uh, 50 odd years ago. And he used to play it a lot and it, it's actually very underrated and it can, it can be played even nowadays and still get some decent results. And a lot of the Yugoslav grandmasters tended to play it a bit in the 70s, but although it's been played for a long time, uh, the possibilities in it definitely haven't been exhausted. And for a player at club level, this is actually an ideal sort of opening. Again, particularly for someone who doesn't want to commit to playing main lines and has perhaps time constraints or, or whatever. Um, the keys to it are basically B3. B3 is the main, the main move which symbolises it, although I'll actually recommend using a slightly different move order. I, I'm going to recommend play it with knight f3, and the main reason is after b3, I think the e5 system is basically pretty good for black. Whereas you can avoid that with knight f3 on move 1, and then after d5, or of course knight f6, but after d5, b3 does tend to work quite well. Now, again, being a system, you're going to play roughly the same moves every time. Um, although in this particular case, you're gonna, the system is also partly dictated by what black plays. Now, this, after d5, there's a few, a few basic things that black can try. Um, the first is when black plays a Karakhan type setup, or a reverse London system, for lack of a better word. In this case, our best system involves a plan with c4. So, bishop b3, bishop e, uh, bishop b2, e3, and then bishop e2, castles, and c4. And gradually just build the position. And it's actually not so dissimilar to a lot of queen's pawn openings. And particularly if you push d4, you're almost in a slav or a queen's gambit type situation. Of course you can play d3 though and try to keep this bishop out of the game. Also, swap the bishop off can be quite useful too, uh, with your knight. Th this system is basically based on general sensible principles. Um, and it's not a lot more you can say about it. You're essentially just playing chess. Anyone who's club level can probably find the right plan here. The system I'd like to talk to you more about, though, is after... After knight f3, d5, b3, if they play a c5 system, you play e3 next, knight c6, bishop b2, and then e6, bishop b5. And what you get here is essentially a reverse Nimzo Indian. Um, it's, also, it's also very similar to the birds opening, which I'll, I'll go and have a look at next. The idea of this is bishop to b5, then swap the bishop for the knight, or you, or you can pin. You can actually exploit the pin first, but it's going to lead to the same thing. Knight to e5. Somehow or another, bishop takes knight. Double the pawns, and now f4. So you can achieve this in a bird's opening through f4 and move one, d5, knight f3. Although. Again, I'm not going to recommend that move order because after f4, e5, Fromm's Gambit, you're going to get a very different sort of position to this. Um, your main idea now is simply castles, followed by d3. Very important d3, not d4. d4 just weakens your bishop and, and uh, uh, eliminates black's double pawns. d3, knight bd2. Knight comes up to f3 sometimes, and this, this always depends a little bit on what structure black's used. But I'll go with it for now. And then a very important move, queen e1. The idea of queen e1 is a queen can develop itself to h4, and also protects the e-pawn in case, in case of nasty, nasty problems later on. Next you play g4, g5, and essentially you're gonna maneuver a rook and queen and if black has castled, uh, castled king's side, black is very close to getting mated here. 
So, particularly in a situation like this, the attack just plays itself. Queen h4, rook g3, rook h3, etc. And the bishop on b2 simply simply dominates the whole position. Um, one one more positional theme I'll say about this opening, and it revolves around the fact that you develop the knight to um to d2. If black ever plays d4 here. It's actually actually a big mistake for black. You simply push, and then you have this square here, c4, where you can just sit a knight for the rest of the game. It simply just sits there and dominates everything in its path. Uh, you need to use this knight, or probably this knight's just as good. Um, you, know, you don't even need to secure it with, with this move. And in fact, you know, that's actually quite a good luxury, because you can use... You can now actually simply try to attack this pawn once the other knight moves out of the way. Another useful thing about the queen e1 move, queen here, we can attack this, obviously here there's a swap on, but a general, general rule, queen moves up to a5, bishop on, um, on a3, very useful for attacking this pawn. Um, even if you don't attack the pawn, the knight sits here for the whole game anyway, and it really, really causes damage in the black position. Another good thing I like about this opening is, oh, of course, uh, Bishop will eventually, after this, move back to c1 and redevelop itself. Um, you can push on the king side now with a very big king side attack. One thing I was going to say, one thing I like about this position is that the end game tends to favour white. So if you're playing it and there's the option of an end game, you can always be fairly confident that going into the end game is going to be to your advantage rather than rather than an, an opening where you avoid the end game at all costs. This is one where you're absolutely fine to play into an end game and you've still got a pretty big advantage there with all black's pawn weaknesses. With um with the pawn weaknesses too, the bishops tend to be a little bit weak. The position's so so blocked up that the knights the knights tend to be better than the bishops here. Um, so if you can't if you can't make them with a kingside attack, well just go for a better end game and and you're really on the way to a win. Uh, thank you.